Uh, welcome to Delta Church's online service this Sunday. We're so excited that you've chosen to log on and be a part of us. Uh, we love the community here at Delta Church and we're, we're so glad that even though it looks a little bit different, we've been able to find a way to have community throughout this whole uh, crazy COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to log on a minute ago, minute ago and say hi in our foyer and just, um, yeah, get to talk to a couple people and see how they're doing. If not, I would encourage you to, to do so later. Uh, but for now, uh, welcome. My name is Pastor Katrina and I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us. Let's worship together.
All right, at this point in our service, if you've been with us before, you'll know that we like to read from God's Word. It's really important for us as a church. We value the Bible and we value what's in here. So not only do we like to sing God praise and listen to a sermon by our pastors, but we want to be reading the Bible as well. So today, I'm going to continue where we have been reading in the book of Mark. So today's text is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. The words will be on the screen as well, so you can follow along with me there or in your Bibles. Let's begin. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you think this why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier? to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus tuned, turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his, grabbed his mat, and walked through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We have never seen anything like this before. Amen. Let's continue. It's so incredible to hear uh, the word of God uh, and be able to just uh, receive what it is that God has for us through his word. Uh, Jeff later is going to be talking about uh, God's word and creation and how that works together. Uh, but right now, I just want to pray over this morning and over you guys in your home. Lord God, I just want to thank you uh, that this morning your spirit is with us. I want to thank you that this morning that uh, your word is here uh, for us uh, and that we're able to receive it and it is able to encourage us and strengthen us. Holy Father, this morning, uh, as we are distanced, Lord God, just uh, provide your spirit in our homes to, to speak to us and to just bless us this morning. Holy Father, we love your name. We love who you are. And this morning we are here to glorify and to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship and just praise the Lord God this morning.
Pastor Katrina here again, and I'm, again, I just want to reiterate how glad we are that you've chosen to log on with us and find community here this morning. A couple of things to let you know about this week. Uh, number one, if you didn't get a chance to log on early and sign on and, and type out a couple messages in our chat, we are going to have a Zoom foyer after the service. The link is going to be posted and it's a time to just log on and connect via video uh, and chat with with other people from the congregation. It'll just be um, a pretty easygoing moment to just check in and say hey, uh, give a wave and a smile at your friends, and hopefully um, just experience a little bit of community that way. That's number one. I would encourage you to log on to our Zoom foyer after the service. Number two, again this year, uh, for many, many years, Delta Church has partnered with Pregnancy Options uh, in order to, to help their Operation Baby Bottle fundraiser. This is one of their main components of fundraising for the full year uh, and it's a fundraiser that runs from Mother's Day until Father's Day. So we're in it a few weeks and if you'd like to be a part of it, uh, all of the information is on our website. So you can go to mydeltachurch.com and find the Operation Baby Bottle page and check out how it is you can get involved in the fundraiser uh, to provide pregnancy options in Surrey. It's, a, it's an important, exciting thing that we get to do as a church Come alongside this ministry. God is good. Again, thanks for joining us. I hope to see you soon. And uh, let's tune in to what it is that God is saying for us through Pastor Jeff. Awesome. Good morning. Hi there. My name is Jeff Beck. And I'm the pastor of a church in Delta, BC on the west coast of Canada. And for those who of you who may know me, I know I may not be recognizable as I haven't had a haircut since the middle of March. And I'm at the point where I may have to borrow a hair tie from my wife and put these flowing locks into a, a ponytail. I know that hair salons and barbers are reopening here in BC, but my wife tells me that she likes my hair longer. So you never know. Maybe I'll be the one who popularizes the mullet again. Ha! I'd like to pray. Lord Jesus, here we are today, and we're once again in, a, in our homes or wherever we're at watching this, and we want to recognize and acknowledge that we have a need of you. We don't know what the future holds. Everything is still up in the air with COVID-19, and it would be awesome that that this would just go away that 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 it would peter out or that a vaccine would be discovered or or whatever the case may be so that we can get back to normal but until we are we trust you we look to you and this is your day and the day that you've made and we will rejoice and be glad in it so would you minister as you have already been doing through the songs and through the the, word, the, uh, the scripture reading and other things that, that we've been doing together, that you would minister through this sermon and give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what your spirit would say to us today about who you are. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us with our worship service online. I really do appreciate it. And we pray and we plan these times with the expectation that you will experience the power and presence of God, whether it be through the scripture reading or through the prayer or through the sermon or, or through all of them. Whatever, uh, wherever and what, what, whenever and wherever you're viewing this, I trust and pray God is me ministering to you right now. Now, of course, we're not meeting together in person in our facility because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to give you an FYI, the board of the church is in the process of assessing a restart of our Sunday service. Because of restrictions due to the pandemic, it's definitely not as simple as just opening up the doors of the building to whoever comes as we've done in the past. And it's going to take a while to work through the logistics of when it will happen and what it will look like. Because when we do open, it will not be business as usual. And I appreciate your prayers and your patience in this process. On Thursday, 
we sent out a, a survey to members and adherents containing questions about a restart of Sunday services in our, our facility. And can I encourage you to respond as soon as possible? Because it's going to help us to formulate the specifics of our planning moving forward. Now let me begin to teach you from God's Word today. The theme of a set of sermons we are preaching about since the new year began is God is blank. And as I've mentioned in previous service, service sermons, we've, we've covered a, a, a lot of different descriptions of who God is. That, that God is good, that he's eternal, that he's omnipotent, that he's sovereign, that he's omniscient, that just judge and many others. And if you're interested, a number of those sermons and teachings can be accessed on our church's website, which is mydeltachurch.ca or through our YouTube page or our Facebook page. And you can access those also from our church's website. And we've endeavored to use the biblical evidence and our own experience with God to describe various qualities he possesses and, and to better understand who he is in a deeper and richer way. So today is another in this set of sermons and the specific quality we're going to examine from the scripture is that God is the creator. Of course, the beginning of this idea comes from the first section of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis 1, 1 to 2 begins with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Genesis 1's story of creation is about how God brought structure to the formlessness and filled the emptiness. He's the one who made everything from nothing. We have to admit that how he did it is mysterious, Although astronomers and physicists and mathematicians have been discovering lots of things about the physical universe and, and have things to say about how things became. One of my profs from my Regent College days the late, in the late 1980s, J.I. Packer, wrote this. To say that God created out of nothing is to confess the mystery, not explain it. In particular, we cannot conceive how dependent existence can be distinct existence, nor how angels or human beings can, can be not robots, but creatures capable of free decisions for which they are morally accountable to their maker. Yet scripture everywhere teaches us that this is the way it is. The biblical evidence is clear that God created everything from nothing. And what we can say about it is that God's quite capable of doing this because he's omniscient, that is he knows everything, because he's eternal without beginning or end, and because he's omnipotent, he has unlimited power. As for scientists, it's my contention that astronomers and physicists and mathematicians are identifying the awesome detail with which God created everything and, and so the consistent message throughout the years the Bible was written till now is that God is creator. And the consistent assumption throughout the Bible is that God's revealed himself to what he's created through what he's created. The spiritual truth is we humans are so important to God that he's been communicating with us throughout history. He's never, ever been silent. And right from the earliest pages of the Bible, we read of how God has spoken, first to individual humans, then to families, then to nations. And he communicated with individual people throughout history, and they've communicated God's message to others. And we call these people prophets and seers and teachers and pastors. But God doesn't limit his communication to a certain class of specially endowed people. He actually speaks to all humans and humanity all the time. Now, foundational, foundational to this 
is Romans 1.20. And this is what it says. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Theologians call this way God speaks to us humans general revelation general revelation and this is the sense of wonder that you experience when you're away from the lights of the city in the middle of a, a cloudless night and you're looking up and see the stars stretching from horizon to horizon i remember going to moose lake camp when i was young in alberta and exploring at night and finding an opening in the forest around there. And I'd lay on my back looking up at the stars and felt the vastness of the universe. And I realized then just how big God is if he could create all that. And I've never forgotten it. And, and I still get that feeling when I'm out in the dark while camping on a cloudless night. I also have a sense of wonder when I'm standing on the beach next to the wild ocean. I have a sense of the glory of God when I'm in the midst of the majestic mountains driving from here to where I grew up in Alberta. And then there's the wonder I feel watching the way animals and birds care for their children. You know, there are myriad ways telling me things about who God is and what he's like because they're the direct result of God's creative imagination and power. And I think... What I experience is also what others experience as well. In Psalm 8, the ancient King David of Israel hints at this. I'd like to read it, the whole psalm, together with you. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. So God's creation has his fingerprints all over it, if we'll see it. And God's creation has the power to bring us to our knees in awe and wonder and worship of him, if we'll let it. But there's another way God shows, has shown us who he is and what he's like. And this is a more particular way. Theologians call this way that God speaks to us humans special revelation. And Colossians chapter 1 Verses 15 to 17 is one of the places describing how this works. This is what it says. Christ is the, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For in him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made th uh, the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Now we can rightly infer that God's revelation about himself is tied to two profound events in history. The creation of everything and the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And these two ways of revealing himself tell us that nothing's outside of God's range of activities. 
He's in control of everything. He's Lord over everything. He holds the deed, the copyright of everything that is, ever was, and ever will be. So, there's general revelation and there's special revelation that show us who God is and what he's like. And there's a place in the Bible holding these two together that God uses to communicate to us. It's John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the Gospel of John. And it's a familiar passage, and we're going to read it together. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Now, it's patently obvious to me, and maybe to you, that the Apostle John wants us to think about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, with the opening words of his gospel. He says, in the beginning. And in the beginning, at creation, something profound happened. And it has to do with something in English that is is called the word. Of course, when John was writing his gospel, he wasn't just pulling ideas and thoughts out of thin air. The Holy Spirit inspired him to be very deliberate in choosing concepts that were already in circulation in, in the Roman world of his day 2,000 years ago that would be meaningful to both Hebrew and Greek thinking peoples. Now you may have noticed when we put John chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 up on the screen, there was a word in square brackets after each time the English term word was used. And it's the Greek word John uses in this paragraph that translates into English as the term word. The word is logos. Logos has a fascinating history in the Greek Roman culture of the Apostle John's day. The school of Stoic philosophers used the word to describe the impersonal force of reason that gave order to the universe. And so it came into the common vernacular of the time, kind of like the concept of the force from Star Wars has come into our common vernacular. You know, it's becoming more and more of a thing on May the 4th of each year to greet one another with uh, May the 4th be with you. But when we do that, we're speaking of a familiar concept and have an understanding of what the force actually means. We know because many of us have watched the Star Wars saga over and over and over again. In Roman society, the word logos had a similar kind of broad understanding. And so with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Apostle John used the concept of Logos to awaken thoughts about the creation story of Genesis for the Jewish readers he knew were going to be reading his gospel. The biblical evidence clearly depicts God using words to construct the universe and our planet and all life. In fact, if you, if you were to look in Genesis chapter 1 and go to verses 3, verses, verse 9, 14, 20, 24, and 26, all of them record the words, and God said. And each time God spoke, something happened to bring structure to the formlessness and to fill the void of what was before he began to speak. And thousands of years later, when John wrote Ch John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and introduced a change in the definition to the word logos that was commonly used in, in, in the Roman times of his day, he was definitely wanting us to make a connection with the creation story of Genesis 1 and the life of Jesus. Now, science may or may not tell us something about the technique God used to create. But what we do know from biblical evidence 
is that God used words as the means to create something from nothing, to bring life from oblivion. And it's important to see how the Apostle John takes the creation story and reinterprets it through Jesus. And that we can see in John chapter 1, verse 14, where he makes a connection between the Logos and Jesus. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so John reveals that the Logos, who was with God and through whom all things were created, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And that person is none other than Jesus. The clear contention is Jesus, who is God, is also the creator and entered into his creation. Look at how John 1.3 begins with the declaration that the Logos, the Word, was involved in creation. And of utmost importance for us to notice is that everything was made through him and not by him. And this is curious. And it goes back to John chapter 1 verse 1, which stated that the Word was with God as well as was God. John John was inspired to pull back the curtains and give us an insight into the workings of the persons of the Trinity. God the Father is the source of all things, but they came through the Word, the Logos, who is the Son. 1 Corinthians 8.6 gives us more insight. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things we are created and through whom we live. So according to 1 Corinthians that we just read, the source of all things is the Father and it's for him we live. And there's one Lord, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, who's also a person of the Trinity. And it's through him that we live, that we were created. The prepositions the Apostle Paul used to refer to God the Father and God the Son changed. The prepositions Paul used with reference to God the Father is by and for. The prepositions Paul used for the Son is through and through. And the different prepositions Paul uses seems to denote the different functions these two members of the Trinity have in creation. All things came from the Father through the Son or the Word, Logos. But what about the Holy Spirit's role in creation? After all, he's the equal third person of the Trinity. Well, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 refers to the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Theologian R.C. Spruill wrote about this. Quote, Creation is not a staccato work. It is, to use another musical term, sostenuto. It's sustained. We think of staccato notes in music as short, crisp, striking tones. Their duration is quick and terse. A sustained note lasts. It has endurance. It is never abrupt. A note on an organ can, in theory, last forever so long as the key is being pressed. Creation is, is such a note. What Spruill is writing about there is the insight that part of the Holy Spirit's work in creation is to hover over creation, keeping things intact. And in this regard, we see the Holy Spirit as the divine preserver and the protector. The Holy Spirit is continuing to maintain what the Father brings into being through the Son. 
Psalm 104, verses 27 to 30, is likely another depiction talking of the Holy Spirit's work in creation. And in this part of the psalm, the writer's looking over the fields covered with growing plants, the land and water teeming with animals and fish, and he exclaims, All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take their breath out, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Now R.C. Sproul's comments talked of the Holy Spirit sustaining what the Father made. And in this psalm, the Bible makes the same declaration. In verse 30, the earth is renewed by the Holy Spirit, and so it's the work of the Holy Spirit to continue to bring order and to sustain creation. Job 33 verse 4 kind of reflects this as well, and it adds to our understanding of the Holy Spirit's work in creation. Job 33 4 reports the words of Elihu, one of Job's friends who, who actually spoke spiritual truth when he said this, For the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now once again, the Holy Spirit's work in sustaining creation is familiar. He's the author of life. Now let me remind you, Genesis 1.1 tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Biblical evidence makes it clear there is only one God and that God's a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have to admit this is a mystery. And so is God's work in creating and sustaining everything that is from nothing. But biblical evidence makes it clear that there is, uh, that, that all that there is has come from God, the Father, through the Son, the Logos, and is sustained by the Holy Spirit. God is the creator and the sustainer of everything. And isn't it true? When we create, we're like God, and people can create art projects, musical compositions, and physical structures, but they've always got something to work with. They always begin with pre-existing matter. Sure, they can manipulate it and form it, but, but it's still pre-existing. And even music and other intellectual creations have rhythms and rhymes and notes and instruments and artistic mediums that provide structure and offer possibilities. But what's commonly called creativity is more akin to synthesis. But God, your creator, had no such raw materials to work with. He created everything from nothing. Now, I'm reminded of a humorous story I came across where a group of scientists got together and decided they no longer needed God. So one of them said to God, we can do all kinds of things through science. We can even clone people and make body parts. So we just don't need you anymore. Now God listened patiently. And then he said to those scientists, Hey, let's have a man-making contest, just like in the days of Adam. And the scientists agreed and began to assemble all the elements they'd need to accomplish this. Then God smiled and said, No, no, no. You get your own dirt. Now about 50 years ago, Hugh Moreland wrote a book called The Meaning of Life. And in order to write the book, he, he reached out to several famous people at the time, and he asked them if they'd help him by telling him what they thought of the following question. And the question is, what is the purpose of life? So here's what some of the famous people that he wrote to said. Isaac Asimov, as far as I can see, there is no purpose to life. Arthur C. Clarke. 
I'm afraid I have no concrete ideas of the purpose of life. There was a famous American philosopher, Thomas Nagel. I'm afraid the meaning of life still eludes me. Comedian Fred Allen said, I say, quote, life is a slow walk down a long hall that gets darker as you approach the end. Another author, Joseph Heller, wrote this, I have no answers to the meaning of life and I no longer want to search for any. Now those were famous people who'd arrived in their respective fields of endeavor. They were smart, successful people in this world. But they were apparently people without purpose in life. At least they couldn't depict it in words. Now the whole focus of this sermon and why I pray the Holy Spirit speaking to you right about right now is that it's God who creates value and purpose in this world and in you. Really, without God, you're left with nothing having any intrinsic value to it at all. Everything you see is nothing more than an accident, a lucky or unlucky chance collection of atoms and molecules. But once you put God back in the picture, life suddenly has purpose and value. And the deal is, you exist because God created you and did so because he loved to do it. You're important to God and you have value intrinsically. It's value you have in and of yourself. And it's God who's speaking to you right now through the words of this sermon talk I've just given. And he wants to continue to say to you and show you how much he loves you. And he loves you so much that, as John said in his, in his uh, uh, story of Jesus' life, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, and that could be you, whoever believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn you, but to show you your sin and to offer you forgiveness. And he can do that now. He can forgive you. He's your creator. He sets the rules. Will you reach out to him right now? Will you find that God is there all along. He's speaking to your heart. I, I, I hope and pray that you'll respond because he does love you. Let's pray together. Father, this is another day of, of COVID-19 and we're apart from one another but still in our hearts we're together because of what the Holy Spirit has done. But I would ask that if there are people who are within the sound of my voice and whatever platform they're using, who are feeling a tug in their heart, in their spirit, that something about what I've said is true, help them to get to the place where they Realize that it is you who's speaking to them and that you really do love them, that you have a purpose for their existence and that there's forgiveness for their sins. Would you minister in every person's heart and in every person's life right now, wherever they're at, in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, we're at the end of another online service. I'm really glad you joined us. It's great to know that you are connecting and staying connected with Delta Church. Um, I'm proud of the work that the team has done to bring this to you. 
I ask that, I, I hope and pray that God will minister and be with you and bless you and keep you. Have a great day.